everyone, welcome back to the course, and in this lecture we're going to have our first beginner project, and it's actually um, everything from this point on in the course is just going to be projects where I'll walk you through every step of creating some very interesting projects I think you guys will enjoy. Now these beginner projects may not be as ex exciting as some of the other projects featured in this course, however it does really reinforce the material that we've gone over in the previous section, as well as just build up that cumulative knowledge we're talking about and just really help prepare you. Uh, if you choose to continue your programming career or just help you build on your knowledge of programming in general. And so let's just go ahead and go a new project in the top right. And in this lecture, we're going to be making a simple game. And we're just going to see how it goes. And I think you guys will enjoy the process of making it. And I'm just going to go ahead and create a name here. And I'll just name it um, my first game because I can't really think of a better name. But you guys can get creative with it, of course. Uh, this is something where I really advise you guys to follow along rather than just watch it. Um, so I'll try and go to a pace that uh, would be easy to follow along, as I will be stopping to explain several things. But I know that some of you guys just want to get into coding, so I will try and scale the time as best as possible uh, to get the best of both worlds there. But we'll just go ahead and get started with making a backdrop. I'm thinking maybe something for a title sequence or like a main screen where we can get like play, settings, information, things like that. Um, I'm not even sure what the game will be yet, but at least I can have that kind of main menu while I kind of brainstorm what the game is going to be. And so, I have my stage selected here. I'm just going to go to art. I usually do at least some art first. I mean, you can't really do much with your project if you don't have some art already pre-established. So, uh, yeah. Uh, that said, I'm just going to go ahead and find some colors I like. I usually like light gray for backgrounds, um, background colors. Uh, I think I'll try that. Let's just see here. All right. Uh, 93 is good. It's nice silvery. Actually, I'll go to the bitmap and I'll convert it back. Okay, so... Let's go ahead and find a good color for our text, for our font, right? Um, I'll just go with like a rose, maybe. That's fine. Uh, I think I'll do pixels since that's my favorite font that is like within the default font package, but of course you can import your own. There's a detailed guide on that in the Scratch Wiki. And I'm just going to go ahead and name it. Oh, I guess everything about what the game is going to be. Uh, I had an idea for something where it's like a cat or just really any sprite that you can move around the... Uh, screen, you know, like up, down, left, right, and then you have to collect the most fruit as possible within 30 seconds, and certain fruit is worth more points than others, and basically you just have to get a high score, and so I guess that would be called what, um, we'll call it Fruit Chase, because why not? Nice little font there. Nice thing about vectors, we can always edit it if there's something I don't like about the font. And I'm going to go ahead and get maybe a little bit lighter color for the subtitle, which will just be the version. And that's just version 1.0. Uh, okay, I uh, I like that. Um, I could actually align this by like it a little bit down and to the right. Um, let's make our button. I'm actually going to get rid of our cat here. And go ahead and make our own sprite. I'm just going to make it from scratch. So I'm going to uh, select the paintbrush here. And I'm just going to go ahead and use my rectangle tool. And get started with that. Do a black border. and Or yeah, this is the border. I'll do a black border. And I'll do a, I don't know, what, what should the color be? Uh, maybe a little bit darker than the backdrop. So something like that maybe. I don't know. How would that look? Yeah, that looks good. Um, hmm. Yeah, I'll have to make it smaller. I'm just trying to see what. Yeah, I think I should make the backdrop or the back, um, the outline a little bit bigger. Yeah, six is probably too much. Five is probably plenty. And I'll just go ahead and make this a little bit less wide. And I'm what I'm doing here is I'm just trying to see, um, based on where I'm putting this, like where might look good, uh, on the screen. And, of course, once I'm done, I'd actually put this in the center and then move it from here by dragging it. That's just because I usually want it at X or Y or at least as close as possible, so it's really easy to move it around using functions. We talked about this earlier. Um, 
for example, let's say it's off here to the side. I just want to go over this real quick. Let's say it's off here to the side. Whenever you're going, like, let's say you make this go the x0, y0 with a function inside your program, it's going to actually go, like, right here, since this is in the bottom left. You want it, like, aligned in the center so that it's a lot more accurate placement. And I'm thinking, oh, yeah, I'm thinking a little bit smaller. And we'll just call it a day. Yeah, that's perfect. And just throw it right there. I just want it kind of aligned with this, like, this, the edge of this F here. Um, I think that's good, and I'll just go ahead and name, do pixel, and I'll just go ahead and go play. Of course, my font is not the right color. There we go. And let's just get that centered. Again, I can kind of help visualize a little bit better over there. Oh, okay, I like that. And I'll just go ahead and color in the background. I'm thinking um this uh, maybe a rose color between this color and this color for whenever it's outlined, like whenever your mouse is hovering over it. Um, I think I'll do that. So let's make a red and then go like this rose right here is good. I think. Yeah, I like that. I quite like that. Okay, so. I'll um, name this selected, and I'm just naming my costumes here because that way it's easier to differentiate between them whenever I'm actually in my code. Um, so on selected would be the one that's like gray since I want it to go red whenever my mouse is over it and gray whenever it's not. And maybe even change size, and then I'll just name this one play button, or name the sprite play button. And I want it to be at this location, and just to kind of save that position, I my uh, when green flag clicked, I'm going to go ahead and go to the motion category. And I'm just going to add a, at least two of them for some reason. I'm going to go ahead and add that just because that's the position I want it to be at. And so it'll just kind of reset it for me. I um, want it to show. And of course, it'll show by default and go here by default if you don't move it. But I might accidentally drag it or accidentally hide it or something. And so every time I start the program, I'll just correct itself. So it's kind of good to have that. Um, I think I'll write the script for um, the mouse pointer hovering over it and changing costume real quick. So I'll just go ahead and I could put this under the same script. But I'm just going to separate it to make it a little bit easier. Then I'll write some comments as well, just to kind of make it as, um, as comprehensive as possible. And so when I go here, um, I want to go ahead and do touching mouse pointer because my sensing uh, is looking for a true or false value. So for example, it's false right now, but if I were to hover over it, you know, it would be true. Of course, they can't really click this while hovering over it at the same time, but um, basically, if it's touching mouse pointer, and this will be true, and if it's true, uh, then the costume will be on selected, and if it's not true, so it's false, it'll be on unselected, just like so. And let's just see how that would work. Um, oh, yeah, one common thing to do with this, or one common mistake made with this, is you need to set the default costume. You need to pre-establish that, so, like, in your declaration script as I like to call it that kind of that defines everything like the position whether it's shown or hidden at the beginning of the program um, I, I'd recommend putting the default costume you want it to be at there or else sometimes if you end the program while it's selected or something like that then it'll actually be stuck on selected until you hover your mouse back over it when the program starts again because that is actually saved and for some reason it, it, it's saved so um, but yeah if you just put the default costume right there you'll be totally fine and what I want to do is I want to change the size, actually. Uh, I think I'll just go ahead and set size 100% by default. I like to kind of organize it by size so it looks nice. Uh, by, by like size of block, that's why I put the set size here. Uh, of course, it doesn't really matter. Um, and I'll make this go 110%. We'll just see how 110% looks. All right, it's a little bit jerky, the motion. So what we can do about that is we can go ahead and make a repeat statement. And uh, yeah, we can do that. And we'll just go ahead and yeah, I think we'll have to do a conditional as well and wrap it with that because we don't want it to go too big. So we want to kind of limit the size. So if size is greater than 
Okay, where is it? Here it is. Size is greater than a hundred. Um. Yeah, we can just do this. So if size is greater than 100, it'll change size by one. But if size is less than 111, uh, then we'll just go ahead and decrease it by one. That's what I'm thinking. And this is useful because um, you can kind of establish your range for the size you want it to be. So I want it to be uh, between 101 and 110. Uh, actually, I'm thinking I should do 99 for this. So it'll be between 100 and 110. Just some, so we're working with whole numbers here. And um, I'll just go ahead and test this out. Oh, this is getting really big for some reason. All right. Uh, let's see. Oh, there should not be a repeat here. Then if size greater than. Yep, this is completely backwards. Other than that. Uh, I want it, I want the size to decrease um, if it's above the threshold and it's not being selected. But I want to increase if it is below the threshold, the other threshold, and if it is being selected. So, for example, it should just kind of be like that by itself. Um, but basically, it's a little bit more of an animation if we do it this way because instead of setting to a like static value, like setting to 100, setting to 110, what we're doing is we're actually changing it by a value it's like by one or negative one so it'll actually um change size um uh, by a small amount but it'll do it like 10 times so you kind of get that animation effect um if we want to make it a little bit faster we could just increase the value let's say the two i'm just messing with the whole numbers here i really like that i really like the way that's animated and so i have this script right here and there's simpler ways to do this that kind of want to reinforce the knowledge of a lot of the things we went over all at once um, and of course, we'll get into some of the more concise ways or shorter ways to do it uh, later on in the course, because you guys will be like pretty much pros by the time we're doing advanced projects. Um, but to get to there, we just need to keep practicing and reinforcing concepts we've learned. And so we've got this play button all good to go. And that is pretty much the main thing we have to do there. So what happens once we click this play button? Well, we need to actually start our game. So what's our game going to be? Well, we have to actually start programming our game now. So I'm actually going to go to make another backdrop. I'll name this one main screen or main menu. And then I'll do the next one. I'll just name it. Um, actually, I want to duplicate this and just get rid of the text. So it's like the exact same color. Of course, I could copy the color, but you know, this is not a terribly difficult way to do it. I'm just going to go ahead and select my dropper or get my dropper tool, select this color and just fill it in. Actually, a better way to do this might just be make, getting a really big brush and just kind of scribbling it out, making sure there's no residual pink left over. And um, yeah, I don't want this to be main menu too. I want this to be, um, we'll just name it game backdrop. So this is like the backdrop we'll see once you're actually in the game. And um, what we can do is we can go ahead and make the default backdrop. Um, we want the default backdrop to be main menu okay and uh, once the sprite is clicked though we want it to go to uh where are you there it is okay so this was like looking for so whenever the sprite's clicked uh it'll go ahead and switch to game and backdrop so just like this so you can select it if it's clicked then it'll just go to the game backdrop but our button is still there well, what we can do we can just go ahead and hide it uh as soon as it's clicked so just like that, and then boom, done. And notice how it's still there; it's just hidden, like it's um, uh, it's still getting selected and unselected. And if we click it, it'll still do whatever action is here. And so what we want to do is we actually want to go ahead and wrap this entire thing within the forever with a if backdrop equals um. And we can either do backdrop neighbor number, number, but I usually prefer to do number. Uh, oops. And I'll just go ahead and go backdrop number. And backdrop number equals one. And of course, backdrop number one is our main menu. So as we can see, uh, it's no longer selected or unselected. Like it's stuck unselected. But, uh, it doesn't like that button is just completely shut off. Not only is it hidden, but none of the scripts are really running. 
Uh, I mean, the forever loop is still running, but nothing in it can happen because the backdrop number is not equal to 1. And so all this, although this looks like a pretty complicated script, there's all these numbers and colors everywhere, it's actually doing quite a simple function. And that's kind of how programming is. I mean, it might look a little bit like an alien language at first, but it's actually not too bad once you really get into the content behind it. And that's what I kind of want to stress throughout this course as well. And so... Uh, let's go ahead and pick out a character we're going to be moving. I'm not great with art, so I'm not going to go ahead and draw my own character, although I advise you guys to do that. If you are good with art, I would encourage you to do that, or if you just want to improve your art skills. Um, that's also a cool thing to do. Of course, you can get the classic cat right here. It's always an option. We have a dog. Uh, let's see. I'm trying to, to, uh, I try not to overthink my, um, sprite choice too much, but, uh, I'll just go ahead and look around here. Yeah, I think I'm going to go with the cat, just because I like the way it's animated, I like the way it's sized and all that. Um, yeah, so I'll just go ahead and name this costume standing. Uh, the name cat is fine, I'm just going to go ahead and rename the costume standing and running. Um, then we'll get coding. So what, what we want to do is we don't want this to be like here, once we start the program, we want this to actually be um, hidden. So what we can do is we can just go ahead and go when clicked hide and then if we go back to our play button class we can go ahead and look at when sprite clicked and what we want to do is we want to broadcast a message uh, I'll name the message game start and although I have uh, gone over this I believe this is the naming this is pretty much the standard naming system for programming so whenever you're naming, let's say, a variable or a string or something like that, what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to name it uh, generally uh, either with like an underscore between the two words. If, if you're messing with a two-word name, which is quite common, is you'll find yourself getting into that situation all the time. No worries. I mean, you can do an underscore, but also what we do is we, we usually make the first word lowercase, and then we capitalize the first letter of the second word. So game start would be written like that. Or uh, what's another word? Let's say banana smoothie would be written like that and so basically first word lowercase second word is capitalized on the first letter and that is pretty much the naming mechanic we use for the majority of programming um, so I'll just name it game start oops I accidentally click cancel there I gotta click OK or hit enter on my keyboard and uh, I'll put that right after the hide so whenever uh, game start is broadcasted we receive that message and then we'll actually show and we'll just go to X0, Y0 as well. I'll just go ahead and duplicate that, because why not? And if we run our project, uh, the cat's not there, but if we go play, backdrop changes, and our cat is there. Now, he's not in the right costume. I want him to be standing by default. Fairly simple. Uh, I'll just go ahead and set his costume. And like that. You don't actually have to put it in, in both scripts, but I just like to keep it clean and... Uh, on what I'm doing, but yeah, you don't have to put both scripts. It's kind of unnecessary code. That's just kind of the habit I've gotten into. Um, and yeah, so I have my cat going all well there. Of course, nothing happens once we actually do that. So um, what we can do is we can go ahead and go when I receive game start, and then forever if, and then here is all our code for movement. I think we'll just go up, down, left, right for now. So I got four conditionals for that. Now the reason why I'm not doing when clicked forever if, or when green flag clicked forever if instead of uh, when I receive game start is because we don't want them to be moving around before we click play because you could actually hit the up arrows on your keyboard or the arrow keys on your keyboard and then it could actually move him before the game actually starts. We don't want that even though it'll actually reset his position which is just still not the best thing. And so what we'll do is we'll go ahead and go into sensing we'll go touching or sorry not touching we'll go key pressed and uh, up, down, left, and right. Oops. Now, uh, there's also WASD, uh, is what some people use, like W for forward, S for down, uh, A for left, and D for right. And you can do whatever you want. You can even do both. I think I'll actually do both, uh, just for the purpose of this tutorial. But, um, yeah. So, if up arrow key press, then we'll just go ahead and change X by, let's say, 5. Why not? Or sorry, 
we're, we're dealing with y uh, whenever so whenever we're dealing with up and down we're dealing with y axis and whenever we're dealing with left and right we're de dealing with x axis so I'll just go ahead and say y by 5 for up and y ne uh, negative 5 so we want to go down if we're pressing down for x it's the exact same thing except for it's um or for left and right it's the exact same thing except for it's the x axis um because x axis is well horizontal left and right and uh well no right would be five and left would be negative five okay so let's just test this I'm moving around my cat now and uh very cool uh it's a pretty good speed i'd say actually and um i guess i'll just go ahead and copy paste this whole thing and no actually before i do that uh, i want to get my costumes figured out so I think what I'll do for that is I'll have a separate script just to keep things organized. I'll go ahead and do a forever loop and I'll do an if. Then I'm going to have a really long operator. So what I'm going to do for that, the reason why I'm doing this is I'm going to do an or. Uh, and I just want to do this for if any of these keys are pressed. Um, the reason why I'm doing this is because if these are pressed, then I want it to cycle through costumes um, so that it looks like he's running. But it still looks like he's standing still whenever he is, whenever no cues are being pressed. So let's just go ahead and look at that. And I think I'll just go ahead and do next costume. Uh, something like this. It's a bit fast and sometimes he'll get actually stuck on running. Uh, and we want the default to be... Um, <laughs> we want the default to be standing. Uh, I'll see what an if else conditional does. Uh, if we just go ahead and put this operator in our if parameter, I'll go ahead and go next costume and then if else it'll just be at. Oops. And then, it, or otherwise, I'll just go ahead and be at um, standing by default. Okay. And also want to have a delay, so I'll just go ahead and go 0.05 seconds. Uh, because it was, I felt like it was moving a little bit too fast, uh, or the costumes were changing a little bit too fast. It's a bit slow, but it works for me, uh, this right here. Um, so if you remember, we talked about rotation styles and how we're almost never going to use them. This is an example where we would, or where we might want to use them at least. And I'm going to go ahead and set the rotation style to left, right. So if, of course, normally it's all around, but what left, right does is we can face this way or this way. It's pretty simple. So, um, what we can do for that is we can go ahead and actually, um, set a rotation style here. And so, if we go ahead and, uh, where is it, point in direction, uh, if right arrow press the point in direction 90, otherwise we'll just go negative 90 or 270. Um, so what this does, right key press, we face this way, left key press, we face this way, and we can also go diagonal. So the reason why it's an advantage over going um, for movement, uh, the reason why you would go if key pressed instead of our, where is our event? Instead of when key pressed right here, I can say when up arrow pressed, and then we just like do something like this. The reason why you wouldn't do that is because A, you can't hold it, so you can't hold up arrow. It would be like you'd have to click it and then keep clicking it for this to work. You can't go ahead and hold. Whereas this, you can hold, and then as soon as you lift your finger off the key, it stops. Uh, and then the other reason is it's just a lot slower and jittery, and it's just, this is a lot better, and this is kind of the standard for, uh, for uh, key input on Scratch, if you will. Just a forever loop or a repeat until loop and then just a bunch of conditionals inside for whatever you want to do. So now we have a cat moving around on the screen. Well, great. What can we do to actually make this game interesting or at least more interesting and actually really fun and engaging to the player? Well, what we can do is we can go ahead and maybe make a timer. And actually, before I want to, before I make that timer, I want to actually implement the uh, the fruit, since I talked about how this was going to be, there was going to be fruit that spawns, and you have 30 seconds to collect as much fruit as possible, and different fruit is worth different amounts of points. So let's just go ahead and look for fruit. Oh, I didn't mean to do that. I meant to actually choose a sprite from the library, because I can't really draw. I'll go with apple for the first fruit, because why not? Uh, we'll just say apples are worth one point. I don't know. Um, of course, we want it to be hidden. 
uh, when the program started. And uh, yeah, so we want it to be hidden. And whenever the we receive the message for game start, however, we want it to actually go ahead and show. But instead of just showing, we want it to pick a random position on the board here. So what we can do for that is we can go ahead and go go to uh, X. We'll just go pick random for now. We'll just go negative 250, positive 250. I'll just do the same for a Y and see what happens. Um, and then if or actually maybe that's too much. I'll try 225. For my domain and range again domain is the range of x values and range is the range of y values uh so just like that and so it spawns at a random spot within a certain parameters for you know the edge it's like it can't go past 225 pixels in any direction but other than that um kind of works and so first of all the cat is going behind the apple we wanted to go in front the apple's a little bit too big and it doesn't do anything when we go over it, so that's three problems. So let's just solve the first one. Uh, we want it to we want our cat to overlap the apple, not the other way around. So we can just go ahead and go win clicked. Oh, uh, we can go ahead and do a forever go to the front. Oh, uh, where's go to the front? Go to the front layer. There we go. So now um if we just go ahead and do that. We are all good. However, this apple is still a little bit big. And I'll just go ahead and go one click set size 50%. And make sure it's been universalized throughout so that uh, it's a lot smaller. So, very cool. And so, nothing happens whenever we go over it. Uh, so, what can we do? We can go ahead and do something like this. We can, if touching, or I, actually, I'm going to do a separate script, but I'll do. When I receive game start and then forever if touching. I'll do an if else. No, I'll just do an if. Forever if touching sprite one. Or actually no, it's called cat, right? So used to our cat being called sprite one from all these lectures we've been doing. Uh if it's touching cat, then we'll just go ahead and go uh we'll go set ghost effect to zero by default. All right, and you don't have to place in like three places like I'm doing. I just like to keep it nice and organized. Uh, or at least for me, it helps me see it a little bit better if I have all these scripts spread out. I just want to verify that it has already been set to zero. Uh, and then I'll just go ahead and go. Uh, so it's just going to change ghost effect until it just goes ahead and hides. I think that's what we'll do. So our apples up here, we go ahead and go, and it uh, that was actually a really drastic, um, a really quick fade away before he goes ahead and hides, and then also once we go ahead and get the apple, nothing else happens. Yeah, it just kind of fades and then it's gone. So what can we do about that? Well, we can go ahead and since there's only one apple, so instead of making a bunch of apple sprites and doing the same thing, what we could do is we could just make clones, if you remember clones, and we're just going to kind of reinforce this. Since I know we didn't spend uh, too, too much time on it in the previous lectures. So we go ahead and go uh, create a clone of myself, um, just like this. And then when I start as a clone, we'll do the exact same thing. Uh, where is it? When I start as a clone, there we go. So it'll just be the exact same uh, thing. And then uh, we'll go ahead and go create a clone of myself and delete this clone. So really all we're doing here is it'll be the initial apple. And then after that's been taken, it'll go ahead and actually we want it to do this. Uh, so it'll actually go ahead and go to a new position, create a clone of itself. The clone will go to a new position. So this goes back to zero and show itself. And then if it's touching the cat, it'll go ahead, fade away, fade away, hide, create a new clone, repeat the process, and then delete the old one. So that way there's only one instance of the apple running at a time. Just like this. Very cool. And we could just do this all day. And uh, that's pretty much all there is for that. Now... This is, um, we can make this get pretty interesting pretty fast. 
Uh, if we go ahead and start doing more, uh, let's let's go ahead and say bananas for our next one. Let's say bananas are worth three points, apples are worth one. Of course, we can always add comments to clarify. Uh, what if we had something that was like super rare with five points? Let's say watermelons are worth five points. Uh, so bananas worth three, and watermelons worth five is what we'll do. Okay. So I'm actually just gonna copy all four of these scripts to each of my banana and watermelon sprites, just because it's the exact same process and it's just basically different textures, if you will. Um, however, if we wanted to mess with probability, um, for how these items actually spawn. Uh, on the screens, like for example, I want watermelons to be rarer than bananas, and I want bananas to be rarer than apples. We'd have to do something else for that, and actually, there's some sort of problem here. Oh, this didn't get transferred over. Okay, so it's not the cleanest setup, but this is basically just repeating the same thing, but for three fruits this time. So now it's pretty much just doing what we were just doing but for three fruits. And it does work, but we want the probability to be different. So what we can do is we can go ahead and take uh, the costumes. And <coughs> one way to do this is using our backpack, which we haven't really messed with yet, but I'll just go ahead and put my watermelon in my backpack and I'll put my banana in my backpack. I'm actually gonna delete my watermelon and banana sprite since I don't need them anymore. I'm going to add those costumes to my Apple Sprite. I don't need them in my backpack anymore, so I'm just going to get rid of them, close up my backpack, and I'll name my Apple items, because now we're no longer just an Apple, we're three fruits. And then the costume will be determined by a, just by chance. So, for example, the first one will be an Apple. Um, well, actually, we don't actually need to do this. We just go ahead and not um have a starting script we can just go ahead and go straight to clones that actually is a much better way to do it come to think of it so it'll just go ahead and create a clone and they'll just keep creating clones and deleting it so but if we wanted to determine the costume and keep in mind the costume determines the points uh what we want to do for that is we're going to want to uh go ahead and do probability so um we'll go ahead and uh, what, can, what can we do for this Uh, I'll switch costume to apple, and switch costume to bananas. Okay. So we can go ahead and do this. If we'll do an if for each of these, I'll, or actually, I'll just wrap each of these in an if. Something like this. So. When would this be true? Well, what we can do is we can go ahead and make a uh, random number generator. Just like that. And so I'll name my variable random number generator. It doesn't need to be on screen, so I'll just check that box. Hide it whenever we start a program. I actually don't need my variable just to keep things clean. I'll just get rid of it. Um, and of course, when click hide variable number, uh, random number generator. And uh, so what we want to do is we want to go ahead and set random number generator to uh, pick random. We'll say one to 10. So if, uh, and the reason why one to 10 is nice is we can go ahead and go by percent uh, in intervals of 10. So let's say we can go ahead and go 10% chance, 20% chance, 60% chance, whatever we want. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and say 10% um, chance for watermelons. 20% chance for bananas, 70% chance for apples. Of course, we can always go ahead and uh, mess with this. <coughs> so if we want bananas to be more frequent, we can just change the numbers here. But uh, yeah, and I'll actually use less than. Uh, just so I don't have to write as much for my operators. So like, let's say, we want, um, what do we want our apples to be? We want to be 70% to start. Sorry. We'll go ahead and go if number's less than 8. So if it's between 1 and 7, 
uh, then basically it'll go to Apple. Now, if it's less than 10, or if it's equal than to 10, then it would be like this. However, uh, we actually want another um, limit on this one right here because it, both of these, uh, like if it's five, then both of these would be true. Let's say the number's five. So what we'd want to do is we'd go ahead and go or, or sorry, and. We'd want to do and for this one. Plug in our variable to the first parameter and then the second one. We'd want it to be uh, greater than seven. So we want it to be between eight and nine. Yeah, we want it to be between eight and nine. So we want 20% chance for bananas and 1%, or sorry, 10% chance for watermelons. So I'll do. Uh, and if you want to, you could do a, a whole lot of fun things with this. You can have like a 1% chance for some rainbow fruit or whatever you want. But we'll just go ahead and do this. Oops, I accidentally did something. It's not good. I think I like accidentally copied it into somewhere. Maybe I just like accidentally copied it into this same sprite. But, um, Anyways, I'll just get rid of these since I don't need them anymore. And now it should be, uh, it should be good. So again, um, there's a percent chance for how these are going to spawn. I don't know where there's just a lonely watermelon sitting up here. Uh, why is that? Let's see. Oh, we don't want it to show. We don't want the initial version of it to show. So there was the there's the clones and we only want the clones, not the uh, not anything else. And so actually, I'll make the default costume apple as well, just because. All right. So let's let's just see. So we have our apple here. So again, apples are going to be the most frequent, as most of the time it's going to be apples. Banana should be the next most frequent, and watermelon's going to be the rarest. And this adds a element of probability to our game, so it's not like there's an objective high score. And of course, you can make that if you want, but just for this, I'm going to go ahead and maybe not do that. But uh, it's completely up to you. And so, uh, what we're going to do is, um, ah, what can we do for this? Well, we can go ahead and put a little score indicator and a timer, because we want it to be within 30 seconds, right? So, I'll go ahead and do score and timer. Notice how I'm keeping it capitalized since it's only a one, uh, only one word. I'm keeping the first letter capitalized. <clears throat> so, uh, I'll go ahead and go timer for this one. And again, there's a timer within sensing. There's a, uh, we have our reset timer and we have our timer value. But I honestly just don't like using it. Uh, I find that uh, y you can really tune the a custom made one to be a lot more accurate. So what I'll just go ahead and do is we'll go one click. We'll go ahead and go something like. Um, forever, or no, what we want to do is we want it to be as soon as game starts and the timer starts ticking. So when clicked, we want it to go ahead and go, let's see, we want to hide it first of all. Nah, maybe we don't. Uh, we'll just keep it shown for now. Um, and then we want it to go ahead and go set to zero. And I'll set to zero whenever we launch as well, because why not? Uh, and then I guess I'll hide it whenever we launch because whenever we launch, it doesn't matter if it's hidden or not. And I'll go ahead and set a random number generator to zero because why not <laughs> whenever we uh, launch as well. Um, so, I mean, again, that doesn't really matter too much, but it's totally up to you. So I'll just go ahead and go repeat 30. Because we want to be 30 seconds, right? Um, wait one second, increase by one. And of course, change will just change it by one. Uh, and then we'll just go ahead and broadcast a message, which we haven't planned for yet, called Game Over. I mean, we could do Game End since we already did Game Start, but I'll just do Game Over. It's totally up to you. Uh, so now our timer's right there. And our score's right here. And so, if, um, what we can do for score, I'll, I'll just test the timer real quickly, actually. Or, sorry, I need to get my showing and hiding for variables down uh, before going any further.
yeah, uh, we'll go hide, score, just to start. And then we'll also go hide, um, or sorry, we'll get set to. Yeah, okay, I like that. Um, And then sometimes I'll do like a sprite for like, if I have like a million variables in my project, I'll just go ahead and, and not actually a million, but uh, you know, if I have a few hundred variables in my project, I'll just go ahead and like do all my hiding and set like all in this own sprite. So it's kind of out of the way from everything else. And I can just kind of go find what I'm looking for faster. This project will be relatively small enough. It won't be a huge deal, but uh, it's still something to consider that that's always an option. So um, yeah. And I'm going to go ahead and show timer once the game starts. Because uh, why not? So we have our timer here. We can actually move this wherever we want. And so once this hits 30... Or yeah, it should it should just stop counting once it hits thirty actually because this repeat statement here. Our score is not being counted yet, so that's just something to keep in mind. And uh, we'll uh, just see if this works. Should be thirty if it stops at thirty one or something. Then we know there's a problem. Uh, stopped at thirty, so we're all good to go. And so game over has been broadcasted. So what happens at game over? Um, well, once game over has been broadcast, we don't want any more of these spawning. And we don't want to have our cat move anymore as well. So I'll go ahead and make a variable called game running. And I'll just pretty much make it a boolean. So a zero for false and one for true. So, uh, and the reason why this is going to be useful is because that will determine whether or not we're within the 30 seconds that the game is running or not. So uh, it'll be zero by default. All we have to do here um, is basically have a receive message. So... When I receive game start and game over, uh, what we can do is we can go when we receive game start, we can go ahead and set it to zero since, or sorry, we can set it to one since we want it to be true. And then we can set it to zero since we want it to be false whenever game is over. <coughs> so, uh, all we have to do is wrap all of our things with a if. Um, game running equals one. So basically, if game running equals true, and if it's actually like shown uh, while it's game's running, um, what we can do about that is like let's say it gets to about here and the game stops running, so it's at zero. I mean, it'll still keep running the script until it's over with. So what we can do to combat that is we can go when I start as a clone forever if uh, game running equals zero. Uh, we'll just go ahead and delete it. Hide and delete. Uh, just like that and Again, we can just go ahead and test this out passively by just kind of actually leaving this running and uh, see how that goes. But let's uh, actually get our score going. I want to get our score working. So if we, it's, it's based on caution right now. So um, let's say that or actually what we can do, because once it's been, um, once it's been touching cat, that's how we know we actually scored. So uh, repeat 10. She just goes effect by 10, so maybe uh, right after our ghost effect, we'll get we'll go ahead and do this. So if um if costume number and it's kind of an order of points. So if because we know costume number two is banana, costume number one is apple, and costume number three is watermelon. So if we go ahead and go one two three, um and I'll actually just add comments apple. Uh, I did not mean to duplicate, I meant to add a comment. Uh, number two is banana, of course. And uh, our, where is it? Number three is just going to be uh, watermelon. Okay. And there we go. Simple set. So, 
now that we got all of that figured out, um, we can pretty much just play around with this and see how our points will go. So I'll just put it right here. Uh, oops, I did not mean to wrap. I just did control Z to undo, by the way, you can undo with your keyboard fairly easily. I'll just do it like that. Um, yeah. And so when our, uh, let's go ahead and get a score. So I'll just go one, three, and five, I think. And our score gets changed just like that. Very, very cool. Stuff for the actually short score. Uh, in addition to showing our timer. Uh, let's set our score. And show our score. So if we showed our score while it's running, we could actually see how many points we're getting. Um, and I think I spawned on an apple and that's why. And by the way, spawn means uh, you kind of appear into the program, if you will. I think I spawned on an apple and that is why my score is at 1. And those clones are appearing. Yeah, where are my items? Okay, there's a little bit of a bug and no worries there. Uh, let's just see. Um, uh, maybe that was on the red wrong spot. I don't know. I'm just gonna mess around with it. Yeah, I put my conditional outside of the if touching cat conditional and that kind of messed it up a little bit no worries though and let's go ahead and get as many points as we possibly can all right so we have 30 seconds and i'd say 30 is a not bad score we got a little bit over 30 this time we got uh, almost Almost 41. So everything stops spawning once the timer ends, and thus we stop getting score. So that that's pretty cool. And so what you can actually do is we can make this a little bit neater. We can go ahead and just put timer and score here. Now there's one disadvantage that uh, items can spawn here and kind of get blocked, but of course we can actually edit that out for our range and domain, for which they can spawn. And I'll go ahead and go pixel. I'll just go ahead and go... Um, Let's see what's actually in the numeric value for that color. I'm just going to go ahead and drop or tool this. Uh, 07389. Zero, oh, sorry, selected. Boom. There you go. Yeah, I'll just go timer on top and then I'll get a score on bottom. I might have to make these two separate text boxes just to like, get the spacing right. So I think that's what I'll do. And I'll go score for a separate one. Something like that. I guess I got to uh, convert to vector. Might be good. Oh, I never did my... Ah, yeah, silly me. I never did my text boxes in vector. I happen to do that all the time, actually. Um. So is that 0, 06389? All right, now let's do it. So we can just go ahead and go timer on top, right? We got a score on bottom. I should have paid attention to whether it was vector or not, but anyways. Uh, let's just go ahead and, I'm gonna use my arrow keys to just go ahead and position this. I love how it's moving the cat as well. Not intentional, but um, there you go. Now I can just go ahead and line this up just right. Oh, perfect. First try. There we go. So now we're actually uh, done there. Uh, actually, I don't want him to move once the game's over. So what I can do is I can just wrap this whole thing with a um, if game running equals one. I'll just set up my equal to operator. I'll just go if game running for my variable. And if it's equal to one, so if it's true, which should be false, right? Then, well, it's not going to be able to move. So I'm actually trying to move right now and his costume is changing. I'm not able to move. 
So if I just go ahead and copy this same wrapper, I can go ahead and conditional that. And now if I have arrow keys, then nothing happens, period. So in fact, what we can even do is we can even do the same for this for our loop as well. So uh, very cool. And we, we actually have a fully functional game now, a fully, fully functional game. So we can actually go ahead and might want to put, uh, yeah, we could put timer and score. Uh, if we could put that somehow uh, on top, like if we made timer and score a sprite and then set it to be go to the front and then set scratch to go back one layer and then set the items to go back two layers, we could kind of layer it that way. Uh, and this program isn't meant to be 100% perfect. Uh, it's just something to start with, and I know my keyboard's super loud, so I'll stop boring you guys with that. But, uh, basically, that's kind of the scope of it. And we can even do, like, a congratulations, you got score, this score, in this amount of time, or something like that. We can maybe make it a costume that says, like, plus one, plus three, plus five, and I'll, like, switch that costume for a second whenever you go ahead and, uh, go over that fruit. So like, let's say you go over Apple, then the costume will switch to plus one for a second or something like that, just to show you did. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and save now and go to the project page and just get a set up. And of course, there's like, this is just a very default skeleton of a game and I want you guys to kind of expand on this and uh, work on it. And if you didn't follow along for whatever reason or if you got something that was slightly different, you can go ahead and go to that studio. And uh, of course, this project will be shared and you can go to the studio. And you can go ahead and look at what I did and maybe compare and then expand off my project specifically. Um, I'll actually name it from my first game, The Fruit Chase. Uh, V1.0 now. Just because of the fact that I actually got a name for it. I got a version for it. So. Fruit or Game Fruit Chase version V1.0 author is me and that's just you to me scratch course all right and i'll actually go ahead and go date publish as well which for me is october 19th on 2019 so we have instructions uh click the play button to start you have 30 seconds to collect the fruits. Use arrow keys to move. Uh, and then we'll just go ahead and say apples, one point, bananas, three points, and watermelons. Five points each. Boom, just like that. And uh, we can even set up like a little high score thing we can do. There's a lot of directions we can go with this. Uh, I'm just gonna go ahead and share this, I suppose. Um, and once I've done that, I'll uh, go ahead and add it to the studio. And uh, yeah, we pretty much have that skeleton for the project I was talking about. Uh, pretty much all good to go there. Um, and of course, uh, I look forward to seeing you guys in the next lecture. We'll actually do a calculator, and we're going to make a fully functional four-function calculator. Four-function calculator, by the way, it's just a calculator, except for you can um, go ahead and, uh, like, it's just multiplication, division, addition, subtraction, just those four functions. We might actually add, like, squares and square roots and maybe some other stuff even. We'll see how it goes. Um, you can even make, like, graphing calculators and scratch and things like that. Um, it's just kind of what you want to do. But, yeah. Uh, I'll show you this, it'll be in the studio, uh, feel free to mess with this, I actually really encourage you guys to mess with this, uh, even if you, like, understood everything I was saying, I still encourage you guys to take a look at this and mess with it, uh, which is great, but, um, yeah, and then I'll see you guys whenever we work on that calculator in the next lecture, and I really look forward to, the, and this is actually, that's probably, like, the most, quote, boring project of all of these, uh, but it's, there's a lot of concepts that get reinforced there, we work a lot with operators and variables, and, uh, actually lists, I think, as well, we could mess with some lists there as well. And uh, I just look forward to working with you guys on that because I think there's a really lot, uh, really lot that can be learned there. And uh, that said, I'll see you guys there uh, in the next lecture. Uh, thanks for watching this whole thing. And I really like the fact that you guys are trying to learn programming. And uh, I'm glad you chose this course.